Have you finished your holiday shopping yet? Don't panic. There's time. There's always Uncommon Goods where Jess and I get all these incredible original gifts for the people on our list. And you could do that too. What are you doing at UncommonGoods.com, Jess? Cutest toy ever and so unusual. I got Lake a little toy house, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Oh my gosh. This is so charming. And they had other versions too. Jen, I cannot wait for her to open this. Yeah, they have the most meaningful out of the ordinary gifts. And guess what? If you're getting close to the holidays and you still haven't gotten anything, you could get an uncommon experience. They're virtual classes. They're unexpected opportunities to have fun and connect in new ways. There's tarot card reading, lunar astrology charting. If you're going to like a party tomorrow and you're like, oh my gosh, what do I get this person? Get them a cooking and mixology class from uncommongoods.com. Isn't that a great idea? That's really good. And with every purchase you make at Uncommon Goods, they give a dollar back to a nonprofit partner of your choice. They've donated more than two Two and a half million dollars to date. To get 15% off your next gift, go to uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara. That's uncommongoods.com slash fat mascara for 15% off. Don't miss out on this limited time offer. Uncommon Goods, we're all out of the ordinary. Hello, hello. It's fat mascara. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our beauty podcast. I'm Jessica. I'm Jen. And we've got Mia Friedman here. She's Mia. Mia. I feel like our third musketeer. I, I mean, I wish. Like, Mia. The parasocial relationship Jess and I have with it's Mia. Deep. She, we, we didn't tell this to her because we were busy being journalists and interviewing her. But sometimes we just watch her and we're just like, should she just be the third co-host of Fat Mascara? I wish. Yeah. She's so great. You're going to love her if you don't already listen to her, follow her, read Mama Mia, which we're going to hear all about her incredible yeah, empire. If you, and if you don't know who the heck we're talking about, let me give you a little background. Mia Friedman is the co-founder of Mama Mia, Australia's largest independent media company, which includes a podcast network with 50 different shows and over 90 female hosts. It's the largest women's podcast network in the world, apparently. Anyway, she made her name as the youngest editor-in-chief of Cosmo in Australia, and she's also the author of four books, including her latest, which she talks about, which is Work Strife Balance. So she's going to take us she takes us through some of her trajectory of her career in media, but I think it's important so you know where she's coming from and the expertise she has when we get into the beauty stuff and get into the beauty stuff we absolutely do. This this is a person with the hot takes that I want on the beauty culture of the day, personally, including like any thoughts she has on celebrities, plastic surgery, her treatments, her favorite products, all of it. So Mia, we love you. Thank you for coming on the show. Let's get into it. Mia, thank you so much for coming on Fat Mascara. This is Major. Long time listener, first time caller. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that is that is very flattering because we adore you and your podcast and your media empire. You have this major media empire over in Australia, and it has its appeal extends beyond your home country or continent, I should say. But for those of our listeners who are not familiar with your career, you didn't start out podcasting. You didn't start out being the head of Mamma Mia. What were you doing before then that led up to this empire? Well, I'm one of the breed of magazine editors from the Devil Wears Prada era. In fact, I started just doing work experience at a magazine called Clio in Australia, which is like Cosmo in its time back in about 1992, just straight after I left school. Mm -hmm. And I knew desperately that I wanted to work in magazines, but I didn't know what anyone at magazines did. That was my next question. Do you know you wanted to be in magazines? Like, why? Because I was a voracious magazine reader and I was the ultimate consumer. You know, I'd started reading magazines when I was, I don't know, eight or nine. There was a magazine in Australia that was iconic called Dolly Magazine. Dolly. Teenage Girls. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I graduated to Clio and Cosmo, but... Because magazines only came out once a month, essentially, I mean, there are some weekly magazines. I didn't just buy the ones that were marketed to me as a girl and then a teenage mm. girl. I bought everything. I bought everything because I loved the medium so much and I cut out the pictures and I stuck them on the wall and on my school books. And to me, my favorite part of the magazines that I read was the editor's letter. 
And to me, they were the celebrities that I wanted to be. I didn't want to be, and you couldn't be a model, but, and the models were amazing to me, but it was the magazine editors and the people that worked at the magazines that were my ultimate. And so I just wrote a letter to the editor of Cleo after I left school and went in and she offered me a couple of weeks work experience. And then I just kept turning up. I just said, can I keep coming back a day a week? And I just kept turning up more and more days until I was coming in three or four days a week unpaid and I was doing jobs on the side. And eventually there was an entry level position of beauty writer that I applied for and I got. I didn't know anything about beauty, literally barely knew one end of a mascara from the other, but it was the most perfect training because beauty editors, certainly in Australia, often went on to become editors. There was a whole slew of us from Vogue to Elle to Cosmo, all the magazines often their editors started their careers as beauty editors. It's like that in the US too. Really? (laughs) Yeah. And I have my own theories about why, but why do you think that is? I've thought about it a lot and I've worked out that it is more than any other role in a magazine. A beauty editor used to be like a mini editor, much more than the deputy editor because you're dealing with, in Australia, the beauty editor had to do the shoots as well as write the copy. So you're learning to write copy, you're learning the visual side with all the shoots, you are liaising with advertisers all the time. So you're the face of the magazine, essentially, you're the de facto day-to-day face of the magazine. Mm -hmm. And you learn about the business of the magazine because you know how important it is to keep those advertisers happy and who the advertisers are. And so it's like a little mini incubator for being an editor. And that's why often when I became an editor myself and then an editor-in-chief and then a publisher, I would always look to beauty editors as my... Your pool, your hiring pool? Yeah. And also my training (laughs) ground. Like if I met someone who I thought had editor potential, I would put them through the beauty editor chair. Well, I just want to make one caveat. I think it was like that. I think now I wouldn't say that. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure it's not (laughs) like that. It's true. All five magazines left. Yeah. (laughs) I think they're they're looking at stylists and like uh, Pharrell. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I decided that I wanted to be an editor by the time I was 25. And that seemed like a really long way off because I was only 20 at the time. But I set that goal and I worked my way up and and I got to the role of features editor at Clio. And then I sort of stalled and my mentor left and someone else was put in over me and I was passed over for the position of deputy. And I decided I'd move to the US and freelance. And so I went to New York and had a copy of my book with all my tear sheets. And of course, they were very impressed then because I was young, but I had a lot of tear sheets because in Australia, you have to do everything. Like you had to, you got a lot of bylines fast because the magazine staffs were really, really small. So I met with various people at Condé Nast and Hearst, but really I knew I had to move over there if it was going to work. So I decided at the age of 24 that I was going to move over. And then I was offered the editorship of Cosmo, which I started just a few months before I turned 25. So that kept me in Australia. And I edited Cosmo for seven years. I then became editor-in-chief of Cosmo, Cleo and Dolly. And then I um, knew magazines were done. I wanted to be online and I was so tired of Wait, what year was that? (laughs) Exactly. Probably 2004. From about 2003, 2004, I'd been saying to my bosses, online, online, online websites. And they were just like, no, we're a magazine company. And, And back then you would take the weakest member of your team and they would look after the website if the magazine had a website. And the website just had little teasers so that people would buy the magazine. That's what they thought websites were for, to make people buy a printed product. And I just got sick of banging my head against the wall in that way. And I knew that the future of women's media was digital, not print. And so Mm. I left and started a blog in about 2007. 2007, you started the blog. And what was the blog's name? Was it Mamma Mia? It was, and it was a terrible name. I have so many regrets. Oh, yeah. Why would you call it Mamma Mia? Well, because my name is Mia and it was an ABBA song and I really liked ABBA and people used to sing that song to me when I was a kid to kind of you know, as a Okay, joke. no, I got the Mia part. I know. And, and you're right. It was a terrible idea because we've spent 15 years No, I didn't years say it was since, a terrible name. I didn't no, say I it think was it a was. terrible name. Because okay. we've spent a lot of years since having to explain to people, it's not a mummy blog. It's not a website. It's not even a personal blog. It's not a website about me. And it's not an ABBA song and it's not a movie. So it's like, it's one of those names that's been hard to explain. But at the time, I just grabbed the URL. Mm-hmm. 
there were so many people working at magazines in the 90s and the early aughts. When you come to like a conglomerate like Mamma Mia, I'm so curious, how hands-on are you with all the stories and the content and the number of podcasts and the videos and the short form videos? Well, it's interesting you say that because at first, of course, it was just me in my lounge room with a laptop doing six posts a day, learning to code, resizing images, moderating comments. Like there was just me because I had no income. And so when I was sort of after about a year and a half, it had built up a a decent following. I think I was getting, I don't know, 20,000 PVs a day, which is pretty good for solo operator, but I had no business plan. I knew I wanted it to be big, but I didn't know how it was going to be big. I don't have the vision necessarily in that way. And so my husband who'd sold his business a little while before sort of saw me in the lounge room again at 2 a.m. breastfeeding our third child and moderating comments, at whatever. And he knew I was burning out and he was like, look, and I'd been asked by, I'd been approached by private equity to run a few, you know, do a few startups of like, uh, what was it called? The, uh, that email news, the Daily Candy, it, back when everyone wanted to do their version of the Daily Candy email. And he'd helped me in some of those conversations. And he just kept saying, look, why would you work for someone else when you can do this? Like they're all coming to you. And so he came on board then after about 18 months as co-founder. And that's when he said, let's see if we can monetize this thing. And if we can't in a year, you can't go on like this. And then the first thing he said to me was, you're the single point of failure. So you can't write everything. You can't be across everything. It has to be a website that you edit. And I was like, that's a terrible idea. And of course that was a brilliant idea. And of course that's what had to happen because I wasn't scalable as a person on a laptop. Mm -hmm. And that was the start of it. But right now, how much would you say your personal opinions and views align with that of the brand? It's growing beyond you. Oh yeah, of course. So we've now got, I mean, I'm doing this podcast at home this morning, but I'm usually in the office. We've got about 150 staff across a few different countries and cities. And in our Sydney office, which is our main hub, we've got probably about 80 people and yeah, we, we do uh, dozens of written stories and we have 53 podcasts, different shows. So we reach about 7 million of the 8 million women over 16 in Australia. And meanwhile, all of those magazine brands, which I worked on and loved, have all closed down, which is bittersweet because it's given us the, prote- yeah. the opportunity to grow Mamma Mia. But as a lover of those brands, and that's what they were, they weren't magazines, they were brands, right? I'm devastated that they're gone. But in terms of my personal opinion, I would say that it's my DNA. It is my DNA, but it's not like I couldn't tell you what's on the website today or tomorrow. I couldn't tell you what podcasts we're publishing today or tomorrow. Okay, uh, We've got fantastic content leadership team and content teams that make those decisions day to day. Is it hard for you to let go? If you started out with your laptop at 2 a.m., putting your emotions out into, you know, and your reaction to whatever you came from. It, I'm sure it was very personal. Yeah. It was from, it was you on the page. And now you don't even know what's on the site right now. You don't even know what's going up tomorrow. You don't even probably know all your employees' <laughs> names. That must feel strange. Yeah. I, I mean, of course it hasn't happened straight away. I've had a long time to get used to it. It's been 15 years since it was, a, mm-hmm. it was started. But you're right. It's less strange than anxiety making because – my name is still in the name of the company mm-hmm. and it's very unusual to have a media company now who has a single sort of face of that mm-hmm. brand. Like when you think about, mm-hmm. even if you think of Refinery29 or if in times when the cut, you've been able to know exactly who it was, but I can't even think of who is the editor or the custodian of the cut at the moment, let alone New York Magazine. And so that's really unusual And what that brings with it is a huge amount of risk. We've spent sort of 15 years trying to help people understand that Mamma Mia is not Mia Friedman. It's not. And so I can't be responsible for every word that is spoken, written or broadcast every day because there are literally millions of those words and I can't. I think like Jane Magazine, Jane. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. And, and... Exactly. And it's it's a big burden because if one person does something wrong, and of course, often that person is me, but when you employ 150 humans, they're humans, they're going to make mistakes, right? And right. the risk is, especially in the time of cancel culture, that it will be my face everywhere. And so sometimes it's hard to sleep at night thinking what's going out there 
that I'm not across. But yeah, it's impossible for you to. Yeah, you have to. Well, this was 15 years ago, but in the last, I don't know, five years, 10 years, social media also grew, which quickly became part of your conglomerate, obviously. But you personally then are, Mia, in a way, Mia Friedman on social media, just yourself, doing a get ready with me video or whatever it is, where you're sharing a lot of yourself still with your readers and your audience. Have you ever struggled with deciding how much of yourself to share? Yeah, I have. Absolutely. And in the early stages of my career, I mean, I came, became a mother just a few months after I became an editor-in-chief at Cosmo and I was only 25. And it sounds so funny now, but for, for the first seven years of my son's life, the whole time I was the editor actually of Cosmo, I never mentioned him. I never mentioned that I had a kid. And was that on purpose or no? Yeah, it was absolutely on purpose. And I, t- I think I told myself that I was trying to protect his privacy, And I also told myself that I wouldn't be relatable as the editor-in-chief of Cosmo if I had a child. And that was something that Helen Gurley Brown, who the patron saint of Cosmo, and we we would have these annual conferences every year with all the international editors from 56 countries. And each of us would get a handwritten critique from Helen on our issue every single month. And I still have all of those letters. Jess and I both have Cosmo in our past and we know the note cards okay. that she used to staple to the issue and inter office mail them out and you would just wait to see what Helen said. Amazing. And, you know, I use that now with my team because I think that Helen was like, she was of her time and some of her things were outdated, but there was a lot in there that was invaluable. And her feedback was always, I mean, the way she wrote was hilarious, but it was so spot on a lot of her feedback. And one of the things that she said was about how we shouldn't run stories about motherhood and kids and stuff in Cosmo because that was not the Cosmo brand. It was a time in her life and it was a brand that was about her. It wasn't about her as a daughter, her as a mother, her as a whatever. It was about her sex life, her everything. And she was right about that. So I tried to tell myself that it would make me unrelatable to my audience. And that was true. But I think also I was just a bit conflicted about my identity as a mother. You know, I didn't have any other role models of people my age that had kids. None of my friends were in that life stage yet. So back to your question about social media and what I keep private, like that was at the extreme end. And back then you could spend seven years. I mean, I I didn't keep it secret from people I met in real life, obviously. Right. But there was no pressure to put anything out. No. And I didn't have to. So then I've learned through trial and error, because after that I had a newspaper column and now with social media and the blog and stuff. I've crossed the line a few times. I've probably crossed the line with my kids a few times. And I've learned, I learned early on that I had to be the butt of the joke. As long as I was the butt of any anecdote and not them, it was okay. How old are your kids now? My kids now are 26, 17, and 15. And now as like many adults, are they telling you what they think about having been part of it all? (laughs) So much. So in my book, Work Strife Balance, my son actually wrote a chapter. He was about 18 at the time about what it was like growing up with me as a mother. And he writes about, and it was actually quite gutting to read, like in all seriousness, like he says some funny things, a lot of funny things as well. But but about how I would breach his trust and how that was really challenging for him when I thought that his stories were my stories. Yeah. Did you foresee, like, you know, when you, I'm going back to, first, I just think it's, it's very, it's a, it's visionary that you at 2004 were like, no, this is, this ship's going down. And, you know, (laughs) you started this blog that became this huge thing. At that time, there was no social media. I mean, maybe in a very like beta way, but the fact that you did this was incredible. But now if you want to be the face of this company in some way, you do have to put your life out there, you know, whether kids or no kids. Was that a muscle that you had to keep flexing or were you like, cool, I get to be out there and I get to be out there in a way that maybe I can express myself in this way that I wasn't able to as the editor in chief? Or was this something that you're like, all right, I got to be out there as the face of this company? Yes, that's a really good point. And I think, look, we've all learned along the way, haven't we? And we've changed as the climate's changed. Like at first I was on Twitter and I love Twitter and I met so many great people on Twitter back in that time around 2007, 2008, because I was at home alone for the first time. I'd worked in an office full of women my whole life and suddenly I was at home on a laptop and 
it was so lonely. And so Twitter was like the cafeteria and you could just find all people from different media companies and other companies and everyone used to try to make each other laugh. And it was a wonderful thing. And it also helped to amplify Mamma Mia because I would post links. You share articles. Absolutely. You, yeah, absolutely. Find like-minded and people. Exactly. And so that was a really big help with the amplification in those early days. In the last few years, I guess I've found my own social media identity, certainly on Instagram, away from Mamma Mia. And because the company is so much more than me and I, I'm not the face of it. I, I guess I'm the public face of it, but I'm not I'm not responsible for all of it. It's so much bigger than me. And there are lots of people that that consume Mamma Mia content that don't have any idea who I am, particularly younger people. <laughs> They're like, oh, my mum knows you. <laughs> that would be a good time, like in the middle of the show, <laughs> yeah. to talk about who actually your audience is. <laughs> yeah. Our purpose is is to make the world a better place for women. So we have – we cover Gen Z to, to boomers – depending on the content. So there are certain content, there's certain podcasts that appeal more to a younger listener and older listener and certain types of content, certain ADMs, newsletters that we do. So it's like anything in the same way that everybody's experience of the New York Times will be different. Everyone's experience of Mamma Mia will be different depending on what they're interested in. I like that you're not afraid to go broad. So you talk about beauty a lot. What do you think right now when you look at the beauty media landscape What do you think is good right now? And what do you think Mamma Mia is trying to write? What wrongs are you trying to write? Oh, what wrongs? So I guess the wrongs that we've tried to write from the start and since I became an editor is for a more inclusive representation of women. Like I was putting plus size women on the cover of Cosmo, much to Helen Gurley Brown's horror. She was slim. Uh, Let's be honest, she was unwell. Like I I spent a lot of time with her and she was of that generation who was incredibly thin and who'd have a lifetime of incredibly restricted eating. We got a note once that a dog in a photo shoot was too chubby. Yeah, she had some real issues, right? (laughs) She had some real issues. She, I mean, she was very funny. She got a, she got breast implants when she was in her late seventies, and her husband was appalled. And it, she was very, she was quite the character. But let's just say her relationship with the body positivity movement was not a strong one, and she didn't really understand the concept of body positivity. So that was something that I built my Cosmo career on, and and another reason that I left in a way because there was only so much you could do because the magazine was full of heavily photoshopped ads, and I wanted something different. So. I have always pushed against that idea of the airbrushed perfection. And that used to mean pushing against magazines and ads and fashion labels. But these days, everyone kind of does it to themselves, right? And some people say, well, that's great. We've got the power. But if everyone's sort of doing the same thing with that power, which is making themselves look younger and filtered and perfect, what is that doing to our brains when we look in the mirror? Because there's no filter when we look in the mirror or when we look down at ourselves in the shower. It's like, cool. Like, (laughs) let me just do this to myself now. Exactly. So I think that my motivation, and it sounds really, um, you know, making the world a better place for women and girls, but that is the filter we put across all our business decisions and all our content decisions. And by that, I mean, will listening to this piece of content or reading it or looking at this video, will it make me feel worse about myself? Do you actually have these conversations live? Like, do you sit at the table sometimes and be like, guys, this is our mission statement. Is this this editorial piece going to make people feel better or worse? Or is this just like... Yeah, no, no. It's... it's or more likely, is this branded content? Oh, a hundred, a hundred percent. But we, that's the branded content we do. And that's why people come to us because we're a trusted brand. Like you can reach, you can go on Google and you can reach many hundreds of millions of people. You can go with much bigger companies than ours and get massive reach if you want to just reach women. But if you want a brand halo and a trusted brand, that brand's got to mean something. And for us, that's what our brand means. No, I think that's great. I wasn't doubting it. I just want to know what it's like, like in the, in the war room where you're talking and you have a topic, like, could you talk about a lot of hot topics? So almost like, do you know what the view is in America? You look with Joy Behar. Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. of course. They talk at hot topics, okay? So you always have a lot of, like, hot topics. And some of them are, I'm like, what are they going to say about this? Yeah. And there are things where I'm like, where are they going to go on this? Because it could be a take where it's like, 
is this going to make people feel better or worse? Is this going to be like an unpopular take? And you do a lot of touchy stuff. But if the net net is you want women and girls feel better about themselves, I guess I know how like the story is going to end. And sometimes you do get a lot of pushback on social for like, this was not the right take right now. And then you, Mia, have to sit with that. And it's interesting what you say, because when you say, I don't know what they're going to say about this, if you're talking about like a written article it's or even a, a podcast, it depends on the I meant person. the royal they. Yeah. Well, that's the problem. There is no royal they, because when you're talking about women, it's like, and, and it, people used to want that from us, at the, like what's Mama Mia's opinion on this? Mm-hmm. And it's like, apart from certain things, like we are pro-science in terms of we believe in science, mm-hmm. pro-choice, of course, and we see the world through a feminist lens. So we're very active in campaigning for marriage equality, for example. So we're about equality through a female lens. But you can still have different opinions within that, right? Like, So there, there are some people, for example, who think Meghan Markle is misunderstood and is just amazing and other people who think she's terrible. Now, neither of those opinions are fundamentally anti-women. They're just different opinions that women have. Okay, it's holiday season, and let's be honest, we're going to buy some things for other people, but it's time to treat yourself, and you know what I'm treating myself to? Honey love, the most comfortable shapewear, and bra. Oh my God, their bra. I like look forward to putting it on. This is what you should do for yourself this holiday season. Get some honey love. Get a bra that fits and goes on smoothly. No little clippies that are annoying, no itchy lace. When I put on my honey love, I know that I'm going to feel supported all day. And it's not one of those bras that you just want to rip off at the end of the day. This is my favorite bra, guys. So they have the V-neck bra, which looks totally smooth. That's what Jess was talking about. They also have a super power short. It's amazing. It has this targeted compression technology, distinguishes between areas where you want more support and where you want less compression. So that feels really comfortable too. And it all just fits your natural curves. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save up to 20% site-wide at honeylove.com slash mascara. This month only. Inventory is limited and the sale ends soon, so don't miss their best deals of the year. After you purchase, they're going to ask you where you heard about them. Please tell them about our show, Say Fat Mascara Sent You. Again, it's honeylove.com slash mascara for 20% off. It's time to ditch the underwire for good, thanks to Honey Love. Yes, you know we live in a digital world, which is good because we're connected, but it doesn't feel personal all the time. Aura Frames, on the other hand, is a digital tool that makes everything really personal. It's a Wi-Fi connected digital frame. This is not the kind of digital frame from back in the day that was all complicated to use. And then it's like, now I must put up new photo and then I have to do all this stuff. You can upload photos in real time to yours or somebody else's Aura Frame. So it's like always the most updated school photo. This is a game changer. I have to tell you, When I send photos of Lake to my parents, it goes to their phone and then it stays there. They got to go back in the text message to find (laughs) the picture of Lake at the park. Get pushed up to oblivion. It's gone forever. Now, this beautiful aura frame, I know what it looks like in my home. I'm going to be getting it for them for the holidays because then I could just update it and boom, it's right next to their bedside or maybe in the living room. Yeah, they go, they log on, you're connected together via Wi-Fi, they're like, there's beautiful lake, fresh photo whenever they need it, but they can keep the old photos too. It's so lovely. It's like a shared family photo album. I don't know. You should just get this for everybody in your family for the holidays. What a great gift. And Aura was even named the number one digital frame by Wirecutter, The Strategist, and Wired. So if you want to get one for yourself or for people in your family or for your friends, visit AuraFrames.com today and get $30 off of their best-selling Carver Matte Frame, that's the one Jess has, with the code MASCARA. That's AuraFrames, spelled A-U-R-A, frames.com. The code is MASCARA. These frames sell out quickly, though, so get yours before they're gone. That's A-U-R-A, frames.com, and the promo code is MASCARA. Terms and conditions apply. But I think some people think like Mamma Mia is like a group think, like what is the Mamma Mia stance? Because they yeah. they see, they want like one 
eight headed monster. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think also, Jess, I think that's a big part of the parasocial relationship. Certainly we find on Mamma Mia Out Loud, which is our like daily podcast, which I'm on with two of my co-hosts, Jesse and Holly, people, because they think they know you, if you don't express the exact opinion that they have on a particular issue, they feel really betrayed. Sure. So I just had an email this morning from someone saying, I would like to cancel my subscription to Mamma Mia because we were talking about something on the show yesterday and we used a word or we didn't use a word that she wished that we had and it meant, and it was like, wow. And I wrote back and she said, I feel like you were my friends, but my friends wouldn't do that. And I went, you know, I think if we really were friends, probably there'd be a little more forgiveness if you're you friends. Wrote that? Yeah, I did. And I said, I understand. Absolutely true. But like, you can't. Yeah, it's like we've had to make a lot of difficult decisions like a lot of content creators have at the moment about how do we cover the war in the Middle East. And we find that when people shout at you, you need to cover it, you need to cover it. What they mean is you need to reflect exactly my opinion. Mm -hmm. And you can't do that. When you're reaching 7 million women, you can't do that. You can't reflect everybody's opinion. So it's challenging. I'm surprised you took that time to respond. Yeah, I think she'd taken a long time to to write how hurt she'd felt. And I, I I said, I completely understand. You know, I appreciate the support that you've given us. But, you know, if we really are friends, cut us some slack because we're trying and we're not always going to get it right. When you're talking, so I want to talk about appearances and beauty a little bit. When you're talking about some of the news of the day and the celebrities and the people like Meghan Markle that make news, do you have any set rules on like what's fair game to talk about and what's not? This is such an ongoing conversation. So we're really torn between, because there's one school of thought that's like, you shouldn't talk about women's appearance because we want, you know, women are judged for their appearance. And if we want that to change, it's terrible the way women are criticized and judged for their appearance. And if we want that to change, we've got to stop doing it. But it's like, there's the world that's ideal, but then there's the world we live in. And I think that, you know, if a woman turns up and her face looks completely different to the way it's looked up until that point, to not comment on it, and I don't mean be critical of it or say horrible things, of course not, we would never do that, but to just pretend that it's not incredibly different feels like a form of gaslighting when women aren't allowed to work, because I think we're all trying to work this stuff out, right? Like, should I have Botox? How much Botox should I have? What does she do to her face? What She looks like she's had work, but what work? Could they be on a Zempic? We're all just (laughs) trying to figure it out. Could they be on? Why, why are we so fascinated with that? Do you yeah. think? I don't. You have those conversations, <laughs> but that they're the conversations that of women course, are having. Of course, you know, <clears throat> like there are all these things that women are doing. Right, we're filtering our photos. We're using Facetune. We're changing the shapes of our bodies in photos. We're getting butt implants and fillers and all of these things. If we're not allowed to acknowledge that and sort of not question it necessarily, but discuss it and analyze why we're all doing it and what it all means, then that's pretty messed up. It's almost as if the more we talk about it, the more we start changing our appearances because these tools are available to us. What's your take on all of the cosmetic surgery and quote unquote procedures that are available to us today? What's your philosophy? Are you a partaker? Wow, Jan, you just went for it. <laughs> oh, God, I, that's the least you can ask. Well, well that's the discussion women have. Of I mean, course, she, of course. No, I was tortured about Botox for so many years and I took so much, I want to say identity and like a degree of smugness, I'll be honest, about the fact that I hadn't had Botox and I turned 50 and my friends made me a cake and on it, it said no Bobo. <laughs> and that was like my badge because I was like partly because I oh, was. Oh, no, she's like holding you to it. Yeah, I know. Well, that didn't work out. I'll spoiler alert. But um, I was like, <laughs> I, I, part of me was like, I don't trust myself. Like it, I'm easier with hard lines than soft lines. And if I have the hard line of I just don't do shit to my face, no Botox, no fillers, then no needles, then that's a clear line. But if I have Botox, I was scared that I would be the slippery slope and then I would end up looking unrecognizable to myself and others because I can have quite an addictive personality. Okay, so you know yourself. And then I found out I was going to become a grandmother. (laughs) And within a few months, I had Botox. (laughs) When I was like 51. And what what did you think? Would you like it? I bloody love it. (laughs) 
<laughs> Welcome. I bloody love it. I'd get it here. But then it's even funny that. So at first I was like, I only want a tiny bit. And I spoke to my dermatologist. And so then I was like, oh, she's, it seemed important to say it's just baby Botox as if somehow that made me morally superior to someone who had the regular mm-hmm. Botox. So I've had to really reflect on my own complicated feelings about all of this. We see this with celebrities all the time. Well, they they say, I haven't had cosmetic surgery, and they know that they can say that, and they're not lying, because they have done everything but lasers and, yeah. you know, all the procedures and whatever. And it's like, now you're just nitpicking words. It's not I true to the theory of it. I don't believe celebrities when they say they haven't had cosmetic <laughs> surgery. Like, I just, like, I, 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 it's like, I just don't believe them. We've spoken with enough plastic surgeons that are like, that was a lie, that was a lie. She was in my office three months ago. That was a lie. I just don't believe them. Because that's the other thing that's maddening. So we've got to do all these things for beauty standards, but then we've got to pretend that it's no work and we were just woke up like this. That's the part about gaslighting. And that's why when people, and I know everyone's got their right to be as private as they want about whatever they do to their face or their body. But I don't know. I feel like it's doing a disservice to other women when you say, I've had nothing. I just use sunscreen. And it's like, well, that just makes a woman go, oh, well, I just use sunscreen, but I don't look like that. And it's like, well, of course you don't because that person's completely lying to you. What do you think of all of those accounts? I know this isn't like mama, under the empire of Mama Mia, but like all those accounts like inject, is it like Injector Bunny or who's that one I love? I wanted her on the show. I What's Injector Bunny? Oh, you send her all the time. I forget her name. D- these are people that they do the YouTube videos where they pick a part of like what they're sure the person got <gasps> done. Oh, you know those kind of accounts, oh, like I love like that. these women. These yeah, do you love ever see it. these videos of like the injectors <laughs> and like the um? They're almost like they've gotten their like self anointed PhD and like, hi, I'm a plastic surgery like cosmetic surgery expert. And while these women are beautiful and like they were beautiful before and beautiful after, and by no way am I saying that they like they had to like here's what they got yeah, done. This is what I think they may have gotten done. And then they have like a 30 minute video of like the person in 1997 and the person today. Okay. I think that's a public service. I mean, I really do because I feel like that's the equivalent for women and beauty standards of someone studying a text or someone analyzing a poem or a photo. It's it's taking this thing and breaking it down into something that we can all understand. And because that's what women are doing privately on dark social in our group chats. I'm In my group chats, we send photos of women to each other and go, what do you think she's had done? Not to not to shame her, but to learn because now beauty did used to be something that you had to be born with. And Helen Gurley Brown was all about making the best of what you were given with and she talked about being born a mouse burger. A mouse burger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There were a lot Remember more limits the then. Burgers. Now, oh my God. like you can buy a whole different face. You can buy a completely different appearance. And I think – it's important to understand... If you're rich. If you're rich, exactly. Well, Estee Lauder said there are no ugly women, just only lazy ones. <gasps> oh. And poor ones. Well, the poor one thing, that was Chris Rock. That was Chris Rock. I think that... Oh, uh, that was Chris yeah, Rock. Yeah, I think Estee Lauder, it's not a nice thing to say, but I like the sentiment of what she was saying, which was, oh, just, do I like it or not? I, I, got the se- I got what she's saying is like, Put a little elbow grease. <laughs> but but it's work. It's it is work. It's work and it's money and it's time. And yet we have to pretend it's none of those things. Yes, she was she was being real about it. Yeah. Well, then, we, but then we have something like that just happened with Pamela Anderson, where she's now peeled back all the makeup, right, and showing us her face. And I'll just put it out there. My first thought was like, of course, she looks like that, and we can celebrate it because she's like a thin, rich, white lady that, like, is already naturally beautiful. So I didn't find it as celebratory as some others did. What was your take on that whole thing? I loved it because I think that things will never be perfect and there will always be another woman who could have done it or a better woman that could have done it. But I think, and, you know, when people use words like brave, it makes me laugh. Like, people even say to me, you're so brave going on Instagram. And I'm like, yeah, I'm so brave. Just forget Médecins Sans Frontières, like... I'm the brave one going on Instagram without (laughs) mascara on. But I think that when you are a woman whose income is indexed directly to her appearance, like Pamela or J-Lo or Gwyneth or all of those women, M. Ratatowski, the way you look 
affects your bank account. And so while you are working within a system that has very strict beauty standards for women and it is oppressive to women, there's only so much you can do or there's a lot you can do, but the consequences of doing it are different to if you or I, whose income is not indexed to the way we look, Mm. go and have no makeup on. So that's why when you sort of proportionally, Pamela Anderson, her value has always been on how she looks. It's not on how she sings or how she codes. And so to me, I thought it was really transgressive in a way much that was received very differently to when JLo made that video going, everyone says I airbrush my photos and here's me and I don't and here are all the products I use and buy these products. I struggled with that a lot more because she was trying to sell a dream that is perhaps a little bit misleading in the way it's being advertised. Yeah. She's also a singer and all these other things, whereas Pamela Anderson was a look. Yeah. That's what she made her money on in a way. Yeah, she could act too, I guess. She was an actor. I don't know if anybody remembers that. <laughs> who else is interesting to you beauty-wise right now? Oh, beauty-wise, who's interesting to me? I'm so interested in in skin. I'm like so many women, I'm wearing less makeup as I get older. And why, and why is that? Because I think it's aging on me. And I've got less and less eyelid real estate as my as my eyes start to fall down. So it's kind of a bit useless putting on Thank eyeshadow. Thank you. <laughs> I try to explain that to Jess, but she has a lot of real estate. Oh, Jess, I've been looking so enviously at your eyelids that just go, Look at those they go lids, for right? acres. <laughs> I understand. She could put like I seven am... colors on there if she wanted seven. to. A rainbow. Look, I can hold it will, it will happen. It'll happen. Don't <laughs> worry. My lids are falling down you. onto my eyelashes. So I'm using less makeup. And also during the pandemic, like so many women, skincare was all there was. So that's when I really went hard on skincare. I love skincare. skincare. Yes. So now I'm the girl, when I walk into Sephora, I will turn towards the skincare, not towards the makeup first. And that's okay. a big change. What skincare are you loving? All kinds of things. I'm a, I'm a bit of a skincare slut. <laughs> that's a brand. Yeah, I'm trying, you know, there's a lot of Australian. That's not great for your barrier function, I Mia. Well, I'm, I'm trying a different thing every day. It's so true. I'm using Caroline Hyron's Retinol Skin Rocks product is amazing. I've just reordered that because you can't get it in Australia. So I get it sent from the UK and it's really worth it. You know, I'm a Tarcha girl, the Tarcha cleanser, mm. Alpha H I love. What else am I using? Augustinus Beta. I've got like a subscription where it's slightly less obscenely expensive, but only slightly. They got you. <laughs> and they, got I you. Rash- they got me and I ration it out. Yeah. So I'm it's just really like, nice. I like the light cream. Yes. I, well, I use the rich cream because I feel like if I'm spending that much money, it better yeah. be <laughs> thick. It better be rich. And you can't crack it open and scoop it out. They don't let you in that one. No, yeah. I know. It's so true. What about fragrance? I'm curious if you're like at all into fragrance. I see on your get ready with me. I know your makeup routine. I could do it in my sleep. Wait, I want, I I want the, wait, when, the red lip recommendation. We want the red lip recommendation. Oh, okay. It is actually this L'Oreal Paris matte crayon. I've got a few of these in different colors. They're really good. I'm going to have to look into that. Yeah. It's just a chemist. You know, I'd, again, during the pandemic, when all the shops in Australia were closed, the only shops that were open were chemists. And there were rules about you weren't meant to browse. Essentials. Essentials, right. But you weren't meant to browse. You had to just, or anyway, (laughs) you had to just, it was very strict. And because I had a whole lot of prescription medication to get filled, I would have to spend quite a long time waiting for that to be filled. So I just would like, the only shopping in person I could do was chemists. So I discovered all the chemist, all the chemist brands or pharmacy brands. But fragrance. So here's a weird thing. I am not into fragrance, but my son who is 15 has a fragrance wardrobe. He is on fragrance TikTok and so are his friends. I don't know how it happened. And he's been collecting fragrances for the last year. And he would, if I would allow it, he would talk to me for two hours a day about fragrance. Let's get him on. Is he into beast mode since? Oh, no, no. He's got really expensive taste. Like the real niche fragrances and he's very, it's wild how much he knows. So I just like one fragrance. I don't like making too many choices. So I use the Molecule number one, which just doesn't really smell like anything. I think it's meant to just smell like you because I'll go and I'll try a fragrance and I'll go, that's nice. But then by the time I get home, I'll hate it. So it's easier for me if I don't have to make decisions about fragrances. 
Isn't it funny how beauty became a hobby for young people? Like, your 15-year-old's into yes. perfume. I know a 12-year-old who's asked me about drunk elephant just yesterday yep. and glycolic acid. Yes. We didn't even have glycolic my, acid when I was 12. My, you know, it's funny. Um, a, a girl I work with, her sister is about 12, 11 or 12, and she was saying that all she wants for Christmas is drunk elephant. And my really good friend, her niece, she's 14, she wants nothing for Christmas but perfume sampler sets. And like, she was not into beauty or anything like girly at all until apparently this year. It's TikTok. It's just taken over. Yeah. It's TikTok. Cause when my daughter, even the difference when my daughter, who's almost 18, when she was around 12, 13, 14, she wanted makeup palettes, like eyeshadow palettes. She would get all these eyeshadow palettes and she was into the the Kylie, a couple of Kylie things. And, and now she's just like, almost no makeup, basic, basic skincare. So it's like a phase. I don't know if, it, but she was pre-beauty TikTok. Don't you think we could guess someone's age by like the hot Christmas present of their youth? Like yes. mine was like Cabbage Patch Kids. And then it was like a Huda Beauty 36 pan eyeshadow in 2014. And now it's Drunk Elephant. I don't know. When you were little, what was the hot Christmas gift, Mia? One of those heads, it was like a giant Barbie head that was cut here and you could put makeup on it and do its hair. I don't remember what it was called. Yeah, it's a Barbie styling head. I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. That's so funny. That's what my daughter wants and she's three. We got we we got one. She she saw Santa for Christmas this weekend and she said, he goes, what do you want? She goes, Barbie styling head. (laughs) So, you know what? Is she scared of Santa? How did it go? She's shy. She's Scamp shy. Santa's terrifying. Why wouldn't she be sad? No, she, Santa? she was shy. Santa's she was so scary. So she scary. was happy. She was so happy. She was just shy. But the elves heard her, right? Don't worry. It, it, it's it's in the car. It's in the car. <laughs> so <laughs> glad. Listen, we can't let you go without doing our lightning round. Okay, ready. Fast and furious. All right. What was the first beauty product you ever fell in love with? It would be an A and A, the fragrance, or an A's, an A's. I don't even know how you oh, say yeah, it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Pretty. I think that was Jennifer Aniston's. I remember reading that in People a million years mm. ago. Oh, another thing that I loved. This isn't quick, but I, I'll give you one more quick answer. Clear mascara. Remember that? That might not have been a thing, but that was a thing, and it yeah. was the only makeup I was allowed to wear to school. God, that was a big nothing. Did it do anything for you? Nothing. Oh, sham. What a crock product. Yeah. Or probably okay. before that, lemon juice in my hair. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What was the last thing you paid for, even if it was like breakfast this morning? Oh God, I pay for things all the time. So I've been trying to stock up on this new, it's not new, it's called Lip Blush from Sephora. And I've absolutely fallen in love with it. They're, you just bought, we met like today. Like, did you go buy like a new, yeah, the, was it the doggy daycare <laughs> like bill? Refrigerator, like, I don't it? know, anything. It didn't have to be beauty, but I love this answer. But, oh, of course. But like, look, I'm not kidding. Oh, when she's I not say, kidding. I stocked Lip up blush. on them. Look at this. Why do you have so many? Where are you going? Because Where? it's at, they're discontinuing it. It's out of stock and I love oh, it. I get it. So I'm terrified. It. And also oh, I like to leave them in smart, like smart. every handbag and in my car. And I want to try one now. They're really, really good. So what I, I give love to your about daughter. Them, what I love about them is that I don't like liquid things that dry to matte. I just don't like the feel of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I like I, I like stains. And these are sort of like stains. Nice. Yeah. But they don't get all like crunchy on your lips. Yeah. No. And so I buy like I don't get sent much. I don't actually get sent almost nothing. I buy all the products that I use. That's crazy. They should send you stuff. That's so weird. They should. No, it's fine. But I also quite like, you know, having my own journey and just discovering things as I'm interested in them. I get it. You know, having been a beauty editor for so many years and then a magazine editor, you do get kind of blasé about all the products you get sent. I found that I would hoard all these things, even though I wouldn't use them just because I felt like I should. But now we just, I let them free into the world and share them around. It's 11 a.m. on your day off. What are you doing? I am about to go into the office. Um, I've got another meeting. I've got some meetings. I've got to record a podcast this afternoon. So yeah, that's my day. I had a, I had no, a on your day start off. this morning. On your day off. Oh, I don't have days off. When you're when you run a business, you that don't. That can't be true. You, I, do, I mean, of course, I have the weekend, but I work on the weekend generally, but not necessarily because I have to, but also because often I want to. My dream weekend is having nothing planned and being able to write my Substack. And play with my makeup. 
and rearrange my clothes. Like that's my dream day and do, you know, do a bit of work in a way that feels creative, not administrative. I understand. What's your favorite snack? My favorite snack is peanut butter toast, but with butter and then peanut butter. What does the butter add to the equation? I'm just shocked. I only just learned that people you do that some have peanut butter toast without butter and I feel like it's a bit nude. It's like sneakers without socks. Oh, I should try it with butter. Maybe I'd like it then. What if you have peanut butter and jelly? We don't have jelly too American, really here. Too American. Uh, no, no, okay. I, lo- I love it, but we don't have je- – like you, jelly is not a thing. I mean, you could have peanut butter and jam. I have that occasionally. I, that's what I mean, peanut butter and jam. Oh, yeah. Would you still okay, put the cool. butter? Oh, yeah, of course. You can't have any kind of toast without butter first. Like what? I'm not a savage. <laughs> then it's not toast. That's just that's just yeah, hard bread exactly. in Mia's world. It's dry. It would get caught in my throat. Come on. Butter's one of the great, great foods of life. <laughs> and then finally, I'm, I'm never not buttering my bread yeah, in the future. True. Thank you for that. Both sides. Why not? <laughs> what do you need to get a good night's sleep? I need my medication. <laughs> I have medication for both anxiety French. and ADHD and HRT. So they're my three things that I have every day. And they keep me not lying. On the level? Not, yeah, on the Ugh. level and not lying awake I have so many night. questions about HRT. I'm going to have to have you come back. I could speak about it for a very long time. I love, I love my HRT and I love all my other drugs that I have to have. Because I sleep well usually. I mean, uh, you know, uh, menopause messed with my sleep for the first time in my life, but HRT certainly helped. We love that you're regulated I'm, now. Most and we love days. you. Jess and I are such big fans. We're so excited to, to have you on the show. I've listened Thank for you. such a long time. I love what you do. We hope you enjoyed the show. It's your reviews and feedback that help us make the podcast even better. Head over to iTunes to rate and review us or email your thoughts to info at fatmascara.com. We also want to answer your beauty questions and hear what products you love. To share a Razor One product review or to ask a beauty question, email us at info at fatmascara. If you send it as a voice memo file, we can even share your voice on the podcast. You can also do that by leaving us a voice message. Our phone number in the United States is 646-481-8182. Thanks so much for listening. Okay, it's holiday season, and let's be honest, we're going to buy some things for other people, but it's time to treat yourself. And you know what I'm treating myself to? Honey Love, the most comfortable shapewear and bra. Oh my God, their bra. I like look forward to putting it on. This is what you should do for yourself this holiday season. Get some Honey Love. Get a bra that fits and goes on smoothly. No little clippies that are annoying. No itchy lace. When I put on my Honey Love, I know that I'm going to feel supported all day. And it's not one of those bras that you just want to rip off at the end of the day. This is my favorite bra, guys. So they have the V-neck bra, which looks totally smooth. That's what Jess was talking about. They also have a super power short. It's amazing. It has this targeted compression technology, distinguishes between areas where you want more support and where you want less compression. So that feels really comfortable too. And it all just fits your natural curves. Treat yourself to the best bras and shapewear on the market and save up to 20% site-wide at honeylove.com slash mascara. This month only. Inventory is limited and the sale ends soon, so don't miss their best deals of the year. After you purchase, they're going to ask you where you heard about them. Please tell them about our show, Say Fat Mascara Sent You. Again, it's honeylove.com slash mascara for 20% off. It's time to ditch the underwire for good, thanks to Honey Love. 